While watching the new moon sighting, it felt like a good enlightening. This day is alright, as the first thought I wish is the night. With family around a nice meal, we're making do our night feel. How nice it is to be so near to those I love. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala mab'uuthi rahmatan lil alameen. Nabiyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to this new program which will come to you live with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal every day of Ramadan days with the exception of Friday at this same particular time from 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock every day on Huda channel. And the topic would be the virtues of fasting. And we selected that we study one of the traditional books of Islam and one of the most prominent books of um, fiqh, and that is the book of Bulugh al-Maram, which was compiled by al-Hafidh ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, may Allah have mercy on his soul. Of course, we all know that ibn Hajar is one of the great scholars of Islam. He was Amir al Mu'mineen in Hadith. He was so knowledgeable that you cannot find anyone who does not depend on his literature, who does not refer to the things that he had written. May Allah have mercy on his soul. And one of the greatest books that everyone knows in Islam is his famous book, Fath al Bari, which was a commentary on Sahih al Bukhari. What is the significance of the book Bulugh al-Maram? What is so special about it? Well, there are a number of books that are similar to it. And for beginners, there is Umdatul Ahkam. And a step higher is the book Bulugh al-Maram. And what is Bulugh al-Maram? Bulugh al-Maram is a book that is compiled and written in accordance to the chapters of fiqh, like any fiqh book. So instead of putting the opinion of people, the schools of thought, that is a Hanafi school, uh, a Maliki school, Shafi'i school, or Hanbali school, Ibn Hajar brought the evidences that the majority of these scholars used to back up their verdicts, and he only puts the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he started with the book of uh, purity, book of Tahara. Then he moved on to Salat and then to Zakat, fasting, Hajj, all the things that are related to the forms of worship. Then he moved into transactions, etc. So this is what or how Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar, may Allah have mercy on his soul, organized his book, Bulugh al-Maram. And this book is so highly reputed and accepted among the Muslims that it is almost taught in all Muslim universities, all Islamic universities. It is uh, uh, something that has to be taught and studied uh, uh, thoroughly. And most of the Imams do explain it and go through it in the masjid because it relates people to the main sources, Quran and Sunnah. I could spend the whole day talking about different of opinion among this school of thought and that. But we could, and we could argue on this for times and times without end. However, when there's a dispute among us and someone says, yes, but the Prophet said, this and that, this is it. This draws a line because whenever the evidence comes from the Quran, or from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, this makes the argument over. And that is why a lot of the, the, the students of knowledge would memorize by heart the book of Umdat al ahkam And if they have the ability, they would memorize by heart the book of Bulugh al-Maram 
as it takes them to a whole new level of knowledge because they have the evidence, they have the sources in their hands and they can quote and they can stem the verdicts straight from these uh, beautiful and authentic sources. So the format of this program would be inshallah that we will try to take the first half of this hour to talk about one or two or maybe more of the hadiths that is in the chapter of fasting from the book Bulugh al-Maram. And the second half would be uh, uh, to answer your queries and questions and there will be inshallah the phone lines displayed at the bottom of the screen as usual. Um, I'll try my level best to answer your questions but no promises. What I have knowledge in I will try to answer that with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. In Saudi Arabia and so many Muslim countries today is the first day of Ramadan. So I pray to Allah the Almighty that he makes this a blessed month for all of the Muslims worldwide and that he gives us the energy and courage to fast, pray, recite the Quran, give charity and offer as many good deeds as possible so that we could get closer to him and that we can attain his uh, uh, pleasure and to attain his paradise. I mean, chapter of fasting. What is the meaning of fasting? And which fasting are we referring to? First of all, fasting or as in Arabic means to refrain. So you can fast from speaking if you take a vow not to speak as found in the Quran with uh, 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 prophets of Allah Azza wa Jal and with Maryam, etc. Peace be upon them all. It also can be to refrain from eating, drinking, or anything that you stop yourself from. This is considered to be fasting linguistically. When you come to the technical definition, it's a different thing. Because the explanation, the definition of fasting is to worship Allah Azza wa Jal through refraining from the nullifiers of fasting from dusk till sunset, from the break of dawn till the sun sets. This is a definition of fasting. So what is the significance of saying that to worship Allah by refraining? Why wouldn't say to refrain from eating and drinking? That, that is it. Well, if you refrain from drinking and eating, this is not fasting. This can be dieting. This can be trying to reduce your weight. This can be you have problems with food and drink and doctors tell you not to eat and drink for a particular period of time. But to fast for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, it has to be with the intention of worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal. And all types of worship, they have to have this particular phrase to indicate that they are forms of worship when you define them. So prayers, one say it is specific acts and words to be said, done in a special format that is uh, inaugurated or it begins with takbir and ends with salam. This is not prayer, this is not salah. You have to say worshiping Allah Azza wa with and then continue this definition of yours. Fasting is to refrain and to worship Allah Azza wa through refraining from these things that we will come to talk about inshallah later on the program. Now, what kind of fasting are you referring to? There are three types of fasting, or actually there are two types of fasting, mandatory fasting and voluntary fasting. So are we referring to voluntary fasting when we talk about pillars of Islam? The answer is no. In Islam, we have five pillars. And the fourth pillar is fasting the month of Ramadan. So how many months do we fast per year? Only one month. And this month is the ninth month in the Islamic calendar. We fast it by worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal through refraining from the things that nullify fasting from the break of dawn till 
sunset. How long would that be? It depends on the region. It depends on the season. So if it were to coincide with winter, daytime would be very short, like eight hours, 10 hours in some places, maybe less. But, it, uh, but if it coincides with summertime, it can reach up to 21 or 22 hours. And this is a lot. However, Allah does not mandate something except that the people are capable of bearing and of tolerating and performing. So Allah does not burden a soul beyond what it can bear. And this is a well-known fact. So fasting Ramadan is the fourth pillar of Islam. And it is a pillar, meaning that if you take one of the pillars of the house, the house would collapse. It is so important that it is one of the pillars of Islam. The voluntary days are not mandated upon you. It's not obligatory upon you to do it. And we will come to uh, uh, show you, inshallah, later on the days to come, the kinds and types of fasting. So fasting is to fast the month of Ramadan. What is the wisdom of fasting? Allah Azza wa is so rich, so powerful. Allah Azza wa owns everything that we see and everything that we do not see. Allah is the creator of the heaven and the earth. Allah alone is the possessor of everything, subhanahu azza wa jal. And those who are uh, uh, thinking otherwise should think twice. There was Allah and nothing was there in the whole universe. Nothing existed except Allah azza wa jal. It was He who created the throne. It was He who created the heavens and the earth. It was He who created the jinn, the angels, the humans, subhanahu azza wa jal. So what is it that He, the Almighty, obligates upon us to fast and to uh, 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 put ourselves in hunger and thirst and to refrain from enjoying what is lawfully ours? What, what, why? why is that? First of all, Allah Azza wa Jal questions others and no one questions Him. So you have no right in questioning Allah Azza wa Jal. Nevertheless, you may ask for the wisdom if it is a possibility because not everything we have is justified to us. Not everything we know, the, the wisdom is given to us. So we may ask what is the wisdom and we may find it and we may not. So, so for example, when Allah Azza wa tells us that intoxicants are prohibited for a Muslim, this is logical. Any atheist would understand why. Any uh, non-Muslim would quite agree because when you're drunk, you do things that you regret. And sometimes you don't even get the chance to regret because it's too late. So it is something for your own good. So we know the wisdom. But when it comes to men not wearing gold and women, it's permissible for them to wear and use gold. So what's the wisdom? Is it the price? Because gold is expensive. I can, it's permissible for me as a man to wear a diamond ring, which is much more expensive than gold. So what is it? This is something that Allah Azza wa Jal knows why. And this is part of the essence of our creation. Allah says in Surah Al-Dhariyat, وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created the jinn and the humans, except that they would worship me. So this is the sole idea of our creation, that Allah Azza wa Jal wants to favor us, to bless us. He gives us a chance to exist out of nothing. He created us out of nothing. And He gave us a chance to choose whether to be in paradise for eternity or to go to hell for eternity. So Allah the Almighty is so kind and generous that He created us to worship Him. And part of worshiping Him is to obey Him. So Allah Azza wa Jal ordered us to do things and we have to prove whether we are worthy of His mercy and forgiveness when we comply and do or we are arrogant and ignorant and the best adobe for us would be hellfire. And part of the wisdom beyond or behind 
obligating fasting among the Muslims is the fact that Allah Azza wa is testing us. How is Allah is testing us? See, everything else you do, people usually can judge you. So if you pray, people see you pray. If you go to Hajj, to pilgrimage, people see you going to the pilgrimage. If you give zakat, the poor are receiving money and you are getting money out of your bank account. So everybody can see that. When you fast, it is, nothing, it is not something you do. It is something you do not do. And that is, you refrain. And it is one of the greatest forms of worship that expresses your sincerity to Allah Azza wa Jal. And your full obedience and observance that Allah Azza wa Jal is, absor is uh, observing you. How is that? When I'm in the toilet performing wudu, the first thing I do is to turn the water in my mouth. It's hot, humid, I'm thirsty. What is the thing that causes me to spit out the water that I was just turning in my mouth? It is the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. When a woman is cooking in her kitchen and she takes a taste without swallowing it, of course, to find whether the salt is okay or not, who's watching? if she takes a whole morsel and takes few bites here or there. No one knows, but she knows that Allah Azza wa Jal is watching over her. And likewise, this child who can take candy and eat under the bed or in the cupboard or whatever, but he doesn't because he knows and acknowledges that Allah Azza wa Jal is watching him. So one of the greatest uh, 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 reasons behind or wisdoms behind fasting of Ramadan is the fact that you acknowledge Allah is watching you and this is a test from Allah Azza wa Jal. Why was it called Ramadan? Beautiful name, short, quick, easy to remember. Why was it called Ramadan? There are a number of linguistic interpretations and the most famous one is because when they gave the names to the 12 months of the year, Ramadan happened to be in summer and it originates from the heat of the stones and the rocks and, 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 and the floor. So they called it uh, uh, Ramadan. And fasting Ramadan is one of the things that admits you to paradise. Fasting in general is something that is rewardable. The Prophet said, whoever fasts one day in the cause of Allah, for the sake of Allah, fi sabilillah, Allah Azza wa Jal would further his face from hellfire the distance of 70 years. How far would a traveler uh, travel in 70 years? Allah would further and depart your face away from hellfire this far. And this is if you fast one day for the cause of Allah. Scholars say that this is a day that is voluntary. So you do the math. What would Allah Azza wa Jal do for you if you fast for His sake and anticipating for the reward a whole month for the sake of Allah, which is obligatory and mandatory? Definitely it has a great reward. Allah Azza wa Jal has put a gate in paradise and called it Ar-Rayyan. So we have eight gates for paradise, seven for hell. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect me and you from hellfire. The gate that, one of the gates, the big huge gates that is a distance of maybe 40 years between them when the, the gates, doors are open. It is called Ar-Rayyan and this is only for those who fast. So imagine you being called from, this day, from that gate with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. So this beautiful month of Ramadan has lots of virtues. And fasting in general has lots of virtues. And the more we learn about it, the easier it gets. So now if someone is watching us in Birmingham or in Finland, as one of the brothers called me from Finland a few days ago saying that, they fast like 21 hours. And 
It is difficult. I'm not saying that. I fast here in Saudi Arabia for 16, 17 hours, and some of us may find it difficult. I don't, alhamdulillah, with the grace of Allah. But some may find that difficult. So what about if it's 21 hours? This means that they have only three hours to break their fast, have their sahur, pray their taraweeh, and th this is too little. However, this is what Allah has decreed upon them. And once they know the reward behind it, and once they recognize how much Allah Azza wa Jal has given them, they will find, with the grace of Allah, the, the virtues, and they will find it easy for them to uh, anticipate, inshaAllah. So now, we take the first hadith in the chapter that deals with Saum from our book, Bulugh al-Maram. The first hadith is the hadith of Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him. He said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, none of you should fast a day or two before the beginning of the month of Ramadan, unless it is a day on which one is in the habit of fasting, that is voluntary fasting that coincides with that day. And this hadith was agreed upon. Now this hadith is quite direct, but there are so many benefits and lessons that we can learn from it. For example, if you analyze this hadith, the Prophet says, والسلام, none of you should fast a day or two before the beginning of the month of Ramadan. This means that if I wanted to fast the 28th of Sha'ban or the 29th of Sha'ban, the Prophet والسلام, is telling me, do not do that. Now, is this prohibiting me to do it or it is not recommended? What's the difference, Sheikh? See, the verdicts in terms of halal and haram, recommended, not recommended, are five. So whatever form of worship you want to do or whatever thing you have to do, you have to apply these five rulings on them. It's either mandatory, obligatory, fart, this is the highest, you have to do it. If you do it, you're rewarded. If you don't do it, you're sinful and you'll be punished. So this is number one, mandatory, obligatory, fart. And number five is prohibited, sinful, uh, forbidden. If you do it, you're sinful, you'll be punished. If you refrain from it, you'll be rewarded. So it's opposite to each other. Then number three is what is recommended. Mustahab, sunnah. If you do it, you're rewarded. If you do not do it, you're not sinful. And this has many uh, forms and many uh, uh, um, examples, such as when I pray sunnah after dhuhr prayer. I prayed four rak'ah uh, dhuhr, then I prayed two rak'ah sunnah. These two rak'ah sunnah are sunnah, recommended. So if I do them, I'm rewarded for that. But if I don't do them, I'm not sinful, but I've lost the reward. Number four, which is the second from the bottom, which is the opposite to recommended, which is not recommended, not preferred, which is makruh. And makruh is something that if you do not do it, Allah would reward you. But if you do it, if you fall in doing it, then you're not sinful. So if I enter the masjid with my left foot, now this is something against the sunnah. It's not recommended, but I'm not sinful. Yet if I enter the masjid with my right foot, anticipating the reward, then this is something I will be uh, uh, um, rewarded for. And number five, which is in the middle, and this is permissible. So if I hold the pen and write, this is permissible. If I don't want to write, this is permissible. It's up to me, whatever. I do. So these are the five categories that usually any form of worship you, or uh, thing you do, you can classify them as such. So when the Prophet says, says, none of you should fast a day or two. Now this is 
an order from the Prophet ﷺ not to do. So when he tells us such an order, is this a prohibition or not recommended? Originally speaking, whenever the Prophet tells us, Hassan, don't do this, it is prohibited. And when he tells us, do this, it is mandatory. Unless there is another evidence that would reduce the prohibition into not recommended or reduces the instruction or order into being recommended. So, for example, the Prophet والسلام, told us not to drink while standing up. So, this is a prohibition. But it was reported that he وسلم, drank Zamzam standing up. So, this shows us that it was not prohibited, it is not recommended. And there are so many examples. This is not uh, uh, the right time to go through it in detail. So when we go to this hadith, the Prophet says, do not. He says, none of you should fast a day or two before the beginning of the month of Ramadan. So we take this as it is for its face value. And we say that, yes, we should not uh, fast a day or two before the month of Ramadan. And there is an exception. And the exception is, the Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, unless it is a day on which one is in the habit of fasting. Okay, so the Arabic text says, except if a man is in the habit of fasting. But a man here does not mean, uh, mean male, it means both. Males and females, so it's not only directed to men. So this means that if you are in the habit of fasting, voluntary fasts, like Thursdays and Mondays, like the fasting of the wood every alternate day, or if you, for example, are used to fasting three days of every month, and on the month of Shaban, you did not have the chance to fast them, except in the last three days of Shaban. In this case, the Prophet tells you والسلام, that you are okay, you are uh, given the permission to fast these voluntary days. And why is that? There is a lot of talk about it, and it's connected with the second hadith that I believe that we would not have time for uh, in today's program. Therefore, I will postpone talking about the remaining of this hadith and the following hadith till we meet tomorrow. We have a short break. And after the break, with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, we will begin to answer your calls if there's anyone watching and has queries on his mind. So stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back. Uh -huh. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Um, you will find, inshallah, the num phone numbers displayed at the bottom of the screen. Uh, give us a call if you have any questions. And um, b by, inshallah, the time we get uh, callers, uh, Selma has a question. She says, I would like to know how I can draw a person in an Islamic manner. I think that Selma is referring to the issue of drawing. Uh, so if she wants to draw a portrait of a human being, is this uh, possible or not? Well, the Prophet ﷺ said that the most severely punished on the Day of Judgment are those who mimic the creation of Allah Azza wa by drawing. So this is something that is not permissible in Islam. It's one of the major sins. A man came to Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with the man with his father, and he said that I am a person that works. This is my earning. This is my living in drawing pictures and making portraits. So he told him this hadith and that this is uh, totally prohibited. So the man yeah, he insisted on Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas told him, may Allah be pleased with him, if you must, in this case, you have to remove the head. 
so that the body has only a body without any head. So this is the only Islamic way of drawing something in Islam that is permissible, that you draw an animal or a bird without having a head, because without a head, it is not something that is alive. We have Um Abdurrahman from Jeddah. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu rahmatullah. Uh, Sheikh, uh, I fast yesterday. That is for the uh, for the fast. It was compulsory. Uh, so it was left one, but I was not knowing about this hadith. Just now you explained the hadith, no? So is it okay for me? I I want to know about that. Okay, Jazakallah khair for uh, bringing it up, Um Abdurrahman. I did not elaborate a lot because the time slot was over. Uh, the issue is that whenever you have obligatory fast to make up, you have all the right to make it up even at the very last day of Sha'ban. This hadith the Prophet ﷺ is highlighting is not including mandatory fast. So women who are making up for missed fast, they can fast it on the 29th of Sha'ban or on the 30th of Sha'ban. There's no problem in that because this is far greater than fasting Mondays and Thursdays or fasting voluntary days. We have Murray from uh, Nigeria. Salaam alaikum. Salaam wa rahmatullah. Salaam alaikum, ya Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam, Murray. What can I do for you? Uh, my question is, I have a two question. Yes. My question, I have a two question. The first question is that, if someone used to fast every Mondays and Thursdays, and then, uh, and also the person is always traveling, always traveling to different places, so many countries, can he continue doing his fasting if he can't, or uh, it's not uh, good for him to to do the fasting during his journey. Okay. Second question. And then the second question, what can someone do to become very, what can someone do to become very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, more especially in month of Ramadan or even after Ramadan? Okay. I will answer your question, inshallah. Uh, we have Samir from uh, South Sudan. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Sheikh, uh, in mid Ramadan, in mid Ramadan, uh, the journey of 1,000 kilometers using uh, a bus, land transport. Of course, uh, I heard that if you have a journey, you can uh, you can choose uh, fasting and you can continue the day after Ramadan. But I want to fast it while I'm also in the journey. So how can you, sure, can you say something about it? Okay, I will, uh, Samir. I will, inshallah. Absher. Okay, I will answer your question, inshallah. Taib, um, um Abdurrahman, we have answered her question, uh, inshallah. Um, Murray from Nigeria, he says that he's used to fasting Mondays and Thursdays, and he travels. So it is also similar to our brother Samir from South, uh, Southern uh, uh, Sudan, uh, the ruling on fasting while traveling. First of all, the Prophet Allahumma salli wa sallim alayhi said a very beautiful hadith that gives a lot of hope to all of us. He says, portraying Allah's kindness and mercy, he says, whenever a servant of Allah Azza wa Jal is sick or traveling, Allah the Almighty would record to him whatever he used to do while being healthy or residing. So if you travel and you're used to fasting Mondays and Thursdays, and you don't because you're traveling, it's hard for you, and you don't fast Mondays and Thursdays, Allah Azza wa would give you the reward, though you're fa not fasting, though you're eating and having fun, no problem. And likewise, if you fall sick, you feel angry, you want to fast, but you are unable to do this, Allah would reward you for that. So for you, uh, Murray, you have no problem, and for you, Samir, if it is not dangerous for you, if it is not hard on you to fast, and you can 
uh, fast without any hardship, there is no problem for you. But if there's hardship or if there's danger on you or those who are with you, it is a must for you to break your fast. We have uh, Iman from, from Algeria. Iman? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam, I hope you have a good Ramadan. Uh, I, I didn't hear you, but I, inshallah you said uh, happy Ramadan and Ramadan Barak to you as well. Yes, Sheikh, I have two questions. Okay. My husband and I moved to a new region in, in Algeria, and when we went to pray Sarawi last night, after they prayed four rakat, they started to make tasbih together. They were saying, Subhanallah, he will be humble, he will for Allah, all together in a group. And then they continued to, they said it three times, and then they continued to pray Sarawi. And I, we were wondering if that's okay or if that's bidah, and maybe we should change the mosque. Okay. And my second question is that I am, um, I'm pregnant, and I'm deep in my pregnancy, and until I'm trying to fast, but I was, I've read a lot of different uh, rulings about whether to uh, just pay back the fast or pay back the fast and give fidya, and I was hoping you can answer that for me, inshallah. I will, inshallah, inshallah. Uh, um Furqan from Saudi Arabia. Um Furqan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Listen to me from the phone and, and mute your TV, please. Okay, okay. Um, okay, I'm listening to you. Okay, um, uh, Ramadan Mubarak to you and keep me in your dua, Sheikh. I will, inshallah, I will, to you um, as well. Sheikh, I want to ask you when we read Tarawi prayer, uh, what uh, Surah Fatiha um, is recommended to repeat after that. And the other uh, surahs they are reading, when they praise Allah or do something, do the people, sometimes people say Subhanallah, sometimes they say Ameen. What should we say or just listen uh, quietly? And uh, when the Ruku and Sujood, they are longer, what, should, uh, what is the best thing to say at that time? Okay. Okay? I will answer you, Shah. Jazakum. Jazakum. Uh, we have uh, Um Mu'mina from Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum. Salam to Allah. Uh, uh, my question is about uh, what is the significance of uh, Salatul Tasbih? I've just read it, I read about it uh, today, and uh, I want to know what is the significance of that and the authenticity and, uh, and the timing for Salatul Duha. What should be the appropriate timing for uh, Salatul Duha? And uh, one more question about the uh, Sunan and Ratib, or we call it uh, uh, the Sunnah that are oblig uh, like Wajib, or hmm. uh, the same, they, 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 they fall in the same category. Okay, I will answer your question, inshallah. Okay, I think we take like uh, five minutes before we take the following uh, caller and answer the remaining questions. Mary from Nigeria, he says, What's the best way to get closer to Allah Azza wa Jal? Akhi, this is all what Islam is about, how to get closer to, to Allah Azza wa and stay as far as possible from hellfire. And this needs a lifetime. Uh, it needs a whole lecture to, to talk about. But to sum it up and in a nutshell, the best way to get closer to Allah Azza wa is to stay away from haram. Totally. Major, ma minor, big, small, whatever. You stay away from haram, the Prophet says, alayhi salam, Refrain and stay away from what is prohibited, and you will become the most uh, 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 the most person to offer good deeds, and the mo most uh, the biggest or the best worshiper of Allah. So do refrain and stay away from haram, and do what Allah commanded you to do, because nothing would get you closer to Allah, and nothing is more beloved to Allah than the things that He mandated upon you. So the minute you do this, you are. Our you are in good hands, inshallah. Iman from Algiers, she had two questions. She noticed that the people in Algiers, after every four rak'ah, they say Subhanallah or Subhan al-Malik al-Quddus or whatever. In Syria, I prayed there and they say uh, um, different th things. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, traddu ala Abi Bakr, traddu ala Umar, uh, ask Allah Azza to be pleased with Abu Bakr and Umar, etc. All of these are innovations. It is easy for you to say 
that something is innovation because if the person doing this innovation fails to provide me with evidence that the Prophet used to do it والسلام, or his companions used to do it, to do this, then this is an innovation. Simple as that. If I say that when I pray, I like to put my hand on my forehead. I say, Allahu Akbar. What is this? I said, listen, putting it on the chest is, come see, come see. I'd like to put it on my forehead because this shows I have great Iman in my heart, blah, blah, blah. This is an innovation. I said, why do you say innovation? Your Wahhabis, everything is innovation, innovation. <laughs> Did the Prophet do it? He said, mm, maybe. He said, if he failed to give me the evidence, then he did not do it, then this is an innovation. So, after taraweeh, after four rak'ahs, after two rak'ahs, offering salutation to the Prophet ﷺ, offering dhikr, tasbih, whatever, did the Prophet do it? Yes or no? The answer is no, then it's an, an innovation, regardless of the country that is doing it. Now, she says that she's pregnant and she wants to know what is the most authentic opinion. Does she fast? Does she skip fasting and pay fidya, expiation? Or does she does uh, does not uh, she doesn't pay fidya, but she make up makes up for it. Does she combine both making up and fidya? The most authentic opinion is that you skip fasting, you dodge fasting when you're pregnant or you're breastfeeding until you're able to make up. Then you have to make up for all these missed days without any financial expiation, no feeding, nothing. Just a day for a day. We have uh, Amr from Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu wa rahmatullah. Ya Sheikh, kaf halak. Uh, actually, I I live overseas. Okay. And then I have I'm, I'm facing a problem with uh, giving my sadaqah. After every Juma, I can see people like non-Muslims. They uh, they are in need. Okay. So so what, the what, thing like. Uh, Amr, what kind of sadaqah are you referring to? Zakat or just general sadaqah? A uh, general sadaqah. Okay. So. The thing like, I don't know if I'm allowed to give them uh, this sadaqah or not. Okay. Usually I don't give, so I try to find Muslims. G good. I will answer your question. Any more questions? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. We have uh, Sabrina from Algiers. Yes. Y yes, Sabrina. Uh, yes. Hello. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you. Uh, yes, Sheikh. Um Uh, I have a question. It's about uh, my mother is um, a Canadian. Okay. Okay, Sabrina. Yeah, she, uh, she was Christian. She was Christian before um, she married my father. And then uh, she became a Muslim. Okay. And uh, well, she had our uh, five children, uh, including me, of course. And uh, after. Um, uh, two years ago, she uh, filed for divorce, and uh, they divorced. Uh, my parents divorced. She came back to Canada because we were living here in Algeria before that, and now she she became back a uh, Christian. She came. She, she she what? She became a Christian again. Okay. So she's not a Muslim anymore. She okay. said that. Uh, so, um, the, the, the main question is, my father is asking us, her children, to uh, stop talking to her and um, because it's haram and I don't know. So, I'm kind of uh, confused there when it comes about your mother, you know, it's not easy to do that and I don't know if it's haram or not. Okay, I will answer your question, inshallah. Uh, we have um, uh, Aisha from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu rahmatullah. Sheikh, I love you for the sake of Allah and Ramadan Kareem. Uh, Ramadan Mubarak to you as well. Um, Sheikh, I have a question. Um, my husband has fertility problems. He, he cannot give birth unless we did do touch. But we have a child, he's like 13 years old. So when I always tell him, let's do it, he'll say, no, he's not ready for it, he'll not do it. If I wait patiently, am I going to be rewarded from Allah or I should ask for divorce? Uh, yeah. And my second question I, is, I didn't get your huh? first question, Aisha. Your husband, uh, you're unable to have children from him? Yes, he's 
health and fertility problems. He's what? Infertility, yes, fertility ah, ah, problems. Okay. Fertility. okay, okay. Okay, so the doctor said we should go to the hospital, we should do test tube, this test tube baby, but he refused. So if I stay with him, will I be rewarded with Allah, from Allah, if I stay patiently? And okay. my second question is... Yes. Did you get the first one, sir? Yes, yes, I, I got you. Second question. Okay. Okay, the second question is, I promised... Hello? Yes, I'm with you, I'm listening. Okay, I hope Aisha uh, sends her uh, second question again. Um, Aisha from uh, Saudi. Hello. Yes, Aisha. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. And barak to you as well. I have three questions. Okay. Uh, if, a, if a person did not wear a ram from the Mikat, so is uh, Umrah is correct or not? Okay. Um, and my second question is, I, when we recite, if we don't follow the mud rules, will it uh, will be uh, sinful or not? If you do not recite what? Uh, mud rules, uh, not elongate the mud correctly, four and three and six. In Tajweed, you mean? Yes, yes, yes. Tajweed okay. rules. Mm. And third and question? My third, my third question is, uh, after the recitation, uh, reciting this dua, Auzu, Auzu bi kalimati Allahi tamma min sharri ma khalaq, Allahumma inni a'udhu wa sta'udhu ka nafsi wa deenik. Should we blow on our hand and wipe, uh, wiping on our body, is this correct or not? Okay. Uh, thank you, Sheikh. Uh, you're welcome. Okay, we will, um, okay, we have uh, Amina from Kenya, I think. And this is uh, the last question so that I can answer this before the end of the program. Uh, Amina? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for the wonderful work you and the other brothers here, inshallah. May God bless all of you. My Amen. question is, can I follow the TV maybe when I'm praying taraweh at home alone, uh, the sheikh in Saudi Can I follow him? Is it allowed? To follow who? You want to follow who? Okay, uh, maybe I'll try my level best. Okay, now we will not have any questions and try to answer what we have uh, from zero to 60 in less than five seconds, inshallah. Um Furqan, she says that the ruling on uh, taraweeh, when people are reciting taraweeh, and she sees them reciting the Fatiha, the Surah, but then the Dua, she's referring to Dua Al-Qunut, when the Imam says, Allahumma ahdini fi, ahdina fi man hadayt wa afina fi man afayt. And people say, Ameen. And sometimes they say, Subhanak. Sometimes they say, Nashhad haqqan. So she's asking, what is this? All of these are baseless. You either say, Ameen, or you just refrain from uh, mentioning anything. So when the Imam is asking Allah, Allahumma ahdina fi man hadayt, guide us among those you guide, you say, Ameen. But when he praises Allah, إِنَّهُ لَا يَذِلُّ مَنْ وَالَيْتَ وَلَا يَعِزُّ مَنْ عَادَيْتَ تَبَارَكْتَ رَبَّنَا وَتَعَالَيْتَ He's praising Allah. You don't say anything as simple as that. Some people think that it is okay to say حَقًّا نَشْهَدْ etc. But this is a basis to my knowledge. And she says sometimes they prolong the sujood and rukur. What to say in it? Well, very easy. In rukur, you praise Allah Azza wa Jal by saying Subhana Rabbi al -Azim. Or Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim wa Bihamdi. Subhanak Allahumma Rabbi Al-Azim wa Bihamdi. Or you say, Allahumma laka raka'atu bika amantu alayka tawakkalt. And you say the rest of the dua that you will find probably in Husn al-Muslim and the description of the Prophet's prayer, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by Shaykh al-Albani, etc. In sujood, the same thing. You have lots of duas that you can say invoking Allah Azza wa Jal, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la wa Bihamdi. And you can ask whatever you want from this world and in the hereafter. So you say, oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, pay my debts. Oh Allah, cure my illness. Oh Allah, uh, uh, guide my wife to be uh, realistic or guide my sp spouse to be generous, etc. Whatever. So all of this is uh, possible for you and you should not stay silent. Um Mu'mina says, what's the ruling on Salat al tasabih It's an issue of dispute among scholars. Some scholars authenticate the hadith, and the majority say that this is not authentic, such as Ibn uh, uh, Shaykh Ibn uh, Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Al-Qayyim, Ibn Baz, Ibn Uthaymeen, etc. 
they all say that this is a fabricated hadith because only Ab Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet uh, reported it, and no one else ever done this specific ritual, and it's strange, and it's not like other prayers, therefore it is not true. Uh, duha, what is the time for duha prayer? From sunrise, about 10 to 15 minutes from sunrise, now it's about 6 o'clock, 2 minutes to 6 o'clock in Jeddah time, up till 5 to, uh, actually, uh, uh, up till 10 minutes before the Adhan of Dhuhr. This is the time for Duha prayer. You can pray within whatever you want. She's asking about the uh, Sunnah and Rawatib. And she said that the Sunnah prayers that are obligatory, and this is not correct. It is Sunnah because it is voluntary. But it is highly recommended because the Prophet ﷺ did not leave them except when he traveled. And there are 12 rak'ahs in the hadith. The Prophet said, whoever observes these 12 rak'ahs in the day and night, Allah would build him a mansion, a castle, a house, a big uh, a house in Jannah. And these 12 rak'ahs are two rak'ahs before Fajr, four rak'ahs before Dhuhr, two rak'ahs after Maghrib, two, uh, uh, two rak'ahs after Asr, uh, Dhuhr, and two rak'ahs after Maghrib and Isha. So once again, two before Fajr, four before Dhuhr, two after Dhuhr, Maghrib, and Isha. These are 12 uh, uh, rak'ahs. Amr from uh, Saudi Arabia, he's saying that he studies overseas and he gives charity whenever he can, but sometimes it's difficult, if not impossible, to find Muslims. So it is, is it okay to give a non-Muslim charity? The answer is yes. Any person who's in need, general charity, you can give it to them. But be careful not to give it to some of the homeless who would go and, and probably buy a, a bottle of scotch. You don't want to do this. So try your level best to help, the, help those uh, uh, who are in need, whether Muslims or non-Muslims. Of course, the pri our priority is to help our brothers and sisters who are Muslims. But if there aren't anyone in need, then yes, you can give it to the disbeliever. Sabrin says, her mom committed the act of apostasy. I pray to Allah Azza wa in this blessed month of Ramadan that he gets her back to the circle of Islam and he gets her sanity back to her head after tasting Islam and then just wasting all of this for materialistic things. The question is, her father tells her that she and her siblings must boycott their mother not to talk to her, not to speak to her. And some scholars do say this, but my personal opinion is that you shouldn't. As long as she is not abusive against Islam, she is not attacking Islam, and she simply just change her religion, this is uh, an act of apostasy. She's in hell forever if she dies like this. By you communicating with her, trying to bring him back to the circle of Islam, uh, to the fold of Islam, trying to give her, uh, um, uh, to change her mind about what is happening, maybe Allah Azza wa would bring her back. You never know. But try to please your father and not disconnect with your mother. Meaning that don't go and uh, face your father head on telling him, no, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Be diplomatic with your father. Try to call her behi uh, uh, yani behind his back. And inshallah, may Allah Azza wa return her back to the fold of Islam. Aisha from Nigeria, she says, her husband does not um, conceive. Well, actually, he's not the one who conceives, but yani, uh, he's either uh, ha has uh, uh, a problem with uh, fertility. And, and she wanted to opt for uh, uh, baby tubes and he refuses the IVF so she says what should I do if I am patient with him am I going to be rewarded I says definitely yes you are going to be rewarded but sometimes a woman reaches a stage where she says I can't go on I want to have offspring of my own and if there is a possibility and he's not even trying in this case if she uh, goes for divorce this is her right and uh, she can uh, do that without any problem. Aisha from Saudi Arabia, she had three questions, maybe? Yes. The first one, uh, what is the ruling on a person who performed or assumed ihram, but not from the miqat? Lots of people come from Riyadh, from Dammam, from India, from Egypt, from uh, UK, from whatever, 
and they land in Jeddah airport without wearing the ihram. They go to Mecca, and then they go to Masjid Aisha or to the Tan'im, and they assume their ihram from there. This is wrong. They should have assumed the ihram from the Miqat itself while they were on the plane. So they have two options. Either they go back to the Miqat and assume their ihram from there, or assume their ihram from Masjid Aisha or whatever, but they have to slaughter a sheep as an expiation. So this is wrong. Uh, the Umrah is intact. The Umrah is correct. But uh, uh, this person has to pay expiation by uh, slaughtering a sheep and distributing the meat to the poor people of Haram. Uh, she's asking about Tajweed. So there are certain uh, vowels that are extended and, and prolonged. So like, for example, وَالسَّمَاءِ وَالطَّارِقُ If someone says وَالسَّمَاءِ وَالطَّارِقُ This is correct. And his recitation is correct. And there's no sin on him, uh, uh, none whatsoever. She says that there are some uh, dua do we blow and wipe our bodies with أعوذ بكلمات الله التامات من شر ما خلق No, the answer is you do not do this as it, not, it was not reported. Last question, Amina says that uh, praying taraweeh behind someone, I did not hear who that someone was, so I would assume that she, she is praying taraweeh behind the TV screen where it's being broadcasted live. Is this possible? The answer is no. You have to be in the congregation. So if you have your child, your son, or your husband leading the prayer and you're praying with them in the same room, this is okay. If you have an adjacent masjid and they're praying congregation, you want to pray with them in your room, this is not permissible because you're not with them in the masjid. This is all the time we have until we meet you. An hour from now, next tomorrow, inshallah, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. While watching the new moon sighting, it felt like a good enlightening. This day is so right as the first time we hit the night. With family around a nice meal. We're making do and I feel How nice it is to be So near to those I love Whenever we think of Ramadan All the good things that we need to do and plan It's not always easy But we'll do the best we can oh.